So we're going to take a really quick look at what it means to truly repent. I've been thinking this week about um, the most important thing that I think God is trying to say to us as a church community during this time. And this idea of repentance has kept coming to mind. And it's a big theme in scripture. And what people don't realize is that um, repentance, although many people think of it as having um, a kind of bitter taste to it, repentance is um, a kind of uh, feeling really bad about oneself or feeling really uh, mournful and regretful about mistakes that um, that we've made, that, that's really not, that, that's part of the picture maybe um, to an extent. I think there is a part of us that, you know, when we come to the Lord and we realize, you know, we do have sin in our lives, like, yeah, that, that is cause for, um, for mourning uh, over our sin. But repentance is really about an entire change of mindset. Um, it's about a new, entering into a new frame of mind. And what people don't realize is that for Christians, for people who profess to follow Christ, uh, repentance is our greatest strength. And I want to just try to explain what I mean by that today and why this time of um, lockdown and quarantine is perhaps the most incredible opportunity that you and I have in our lifetime to engage in repentance on a new level. So let me just read. I'm not even going to read a passage. This is like, it's not even a verse. It's half a verse. And it's from Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15a. And this is what it says. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and strength. In quietness and trust is your strength. So I feel and believe that um, what we're experiencing right now, you know, in the midst of COVID-19 and everything that is happening is a kind of exile. We have been exiled from everything that is familiar and much of what our lives have typically been about. We have been torn away from our regular way of doing life, and many of the things that are familiar to us have been stripped away from us. So in a sense, we're, we're exile. We're home, but we're in exile. And I think if we start to think about, um, for anybody who's asking, that was Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15a. Um, when we start to think of our current experience in terms of exile, what we realize is that the Bible actually has a lot to say in terms of thinking about exile. And incredibly, um, sometimes it, it is in a one day of suffering that we can experience an acceleration of what God is doing in our life, more so than a hundred days of everything being fine and dandy. And if you look biblically and you think about, you know, what was accomplished during times of exile, let me just list a couple things. During exile, Daniel, uh, who had been stripped away from his hometown of Jerusalem, became a mentor to the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. He became a father to King Nebuchadnezzar, a foreign empire uh, and a foreign leader. During exile, Joseph, who was imprisoned away from his family, became a father to Pharaoh of Egypt and his household. I don't know if you knew this, but the Bible was actually compiled during exile. Uh, the Jews were exiled in Babylon, and we even have an Old Testament or a Hebrew scripture because of exile, because when the exiles were in Babylon, that was when the scriptures were all gathered and assembled and put together into one book. During exile, Moses went from being a brash um, warrior, uh, unthinking and uncaring, a blunt instrument, to spending 40 years in the wilderness as a shepherd. And God used that period of time of his exile to prepare him for one of the most colossal and epic um, deliverances of God in the Bible, which was, of course, the Exodus, God delivering his people from slavery in, in Exodus. Um, Pastor John wrote a very interesting article recently in which he pointed out that that word quarantine actually has Latin roots, meaning 40. And so this idea of 40 years or 40 days in exile or in the desert uh, has often been a time in which God has incredibly shaped his people prepared them for great works of righteousness. Jesus himself was exiled, so to speak, um, when he was brought into the wilderness, into the desert for 40 days. Everything was taken away from him. He had no food or drink. And God used that time to prepare him for an, a ministry, which would, of course, change the very trajectory of civilization. And finally, my last example is that the Christian community itself was exiled from Jerusalem when the per persecution was... Um, was uh, brought against the Christian 
uh, Jews in Jerusalem in the first century, and it was a result of that exile that the Christian message, the gospel, spread out and took root, transforming culture, transforming the very Roman Empire. All these things happened in the midst of exile. And so let's just take a biblical perspective then and think about what is it that exile offers us? How can we make the most of exile? And I want to say three ways. And if you have a piece of paper or you have your phone out, I, I think it would be really helpful for you to write these three things down because you can take this to God in prayer during your devotions or during a time where you have a minute just to be by yourself and think about how these three things are really coming into play in your life during this time, okay? And the first thing I want you to say is, God, how are you using this exile as a time to press the reset button on my life? I was having a conversation with somebody from church uh, just this week, and he shared about how the, the result of the quarantine has been that pretty much everything that he looks to in life for significance has been stripped away. He's not able to meet with friends. He's not able to do the things he's loved. He's not able to work. He was in the midst of trying to get a new business started. He's not able to do that. And all these things had been sources of inspiration for him. They'd been things that gave him a sense of value and a sense of significance in the world. And yet in exile, uh, all these things have been stripped away. And I think that's what God is doing in the church right now. He's stripping away all these false things. He's stripping us down naked. He's causing us to look to him and to realize that our only and most sustainable and real source of value and security and significance in this world is God himself. So God is pressing the reset button on his church and causing him, causing us rather, to look to him in a new way. But only if, only if, and I'm going to come back to what that if is. It only works if, and I'll come back to that. So number two, the time of exile is a time for God to teach us what compassion really looks like. For a lot of us, we are experiencing a level of suffering and pain that we've never experienced in our life. And it is horrible and it is tragic and it is extremely painful. And, um, you know, there's not one of us that would ever have chosen this. But there is one thing that throughout the Bible, when God exiles his people, when his, parents, uh, his people experience exile, that there is a shaping of character and that happens because God is using our suffering to teach us how to relate to those who are also suffering. There is a sense in which we cannot truly stand with the broken and with those who have been the victims of injustice and refugees and the poor and the homeless unless we ourselves experience pain and suffering and know what it's like. But if we can embrace this and if we can manage through it, if, right, if, then this gives us an incredible, incredible ability to be able to have empathy and to be able to have compassion for those who are suffering. Uh, this is no small accomplishment. And finally, so, so you could say, you know, in your prayer time, in your journal, Lord, in my suffering, how are you teaching me compassion? How are you teaching me to empathize with those who are suffering? And finally, I will say that exile, um, one of the greatest opportunities or benefits of exile is that it is a test. It is a test. And during our time of suffering or time of discomfort, the question that is being put to us that every single one of us, I think, has to wrestle with right now is looking to God and say, God, in the midst of this horrible situation, are you still good? God, do you still love me? God, are you still there? God, are you somebody that I can trust and I can depend on you and I can build my life on you despite these situations? Um, I'm in a little pastor's reading group, and we read um, portions of the Ars Moriendi. For those of you who haven't heard of it, um, the Ars Moriendi was actually the most published book, the most printed book in the Middle Ages. There were uh, tens of thousands of copies, and Ars Moriendi is Latin for the art of dying. That's pretty crazy, right, that a book on dying would be the most popular book uh, in the world. I think it was because of the plagues, uh, and many people were dying. And so there was this question of, how do we die well? Um, and one of the things that as I was reading that, it, it really jumped out to me was one of the authors said, 
that <clears throat> when a person is on their deathbed and they're in, in a place of incredible suffering, that the gravest sin for that person to commit is the sin of despair, the sin of despair. And that really um, caught me off guard and it, it offended me initially because I, I thought, wow, that's really, that's really a harsh thing to say to somebody who is despairing, right? Like you're sinning by despairing. Uh, and yet what the author pointed out is that when someone despairs and how do we define despair? Well, I think we could define despair as giving up hope, saying, I'm not going to have any more hope. Hope is over. There's no reason to hope. When you despair, right, what you're really saying is that in the midst of what I'm going through right now, um, God has abandoned us and God is no longer to be trusted. And when you think about that, maybe despair is the greatest sin because despair is saying that God is not able to handle this or God's grace doesn't cover my sin or my suffering somehow negates God's love for me or God's ability to be able to turn this horrible situation into his good. And so exile, we could fall away. We could turn our back on God. We could say, this is too much. I'm done. I've had it. Or we could ask God, we could use this as an opportunity in exile to look God in the face and say, God, can I really trust you right now in the midst of everything that's happening, in the midst of all the loss, in the midst of canceled wedding plans, in the midst of jobs that have completely fallen through, in the midst of startup projects that have not materialized. God, are you still good? God, are you still there? God, are you able to take these very, very horrible and difficult situations and bring it for my good and for the good of your people? And so it is a test, exile is a test. And you could ask God, God, what are you, how are you testing me right now? And if we pass these tests and if we take advantage of these opportunities, then exile can be something that God wants to use for your life and to my life to do something incredible, an absolute acceleration of his grace in our lives that empowers us and strengthens us for the future. If, now I've been saying if many times, if, 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 if what, if what? And the if is this, <clears throat> exile will turn out for the church is good if, and that is only if we embrace the call of faith and repentance during this time, the invitation that God extends to each one of us to put our faith and trust in him and to repent, to be completely transformed. Let me reread to you um, a passage that I think is probably one of the most important passages for our time during this COVID situation. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 13 and 14. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin, their sin and will heal their land. Faith and repentance are not optional for people who profess to follow God and are seeking to follow God. But we've heard a lot about faith and repentance. You know, what are we really talking about? When we talk about faith and repentance, what does that mean? Faith and repentance is a call to trust God like we've never trusted him before. We're facing a situation that none of us has ever faced. And the difficult part about this is we're just not sure if there's going to be an end. We're not sure when the end comes, what things will look like on the other side. We're stepping into a situation where we're so out of control. I mean, I think that that's one of the things, you know, besides feeling like I'm imprisoned, I think what, one of the things that's been the most difficult for my wife and I is we just feel like we have no control. Um, feel like everything is out of our control, but maybe this is exactly where God wants us. And if this is our situation, then what does faith and repentance looks like? Faith and repentance means I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust you, Lord, even though I can't make sense of this, even though I feel like I have no control. And even though this is very difficult, and I'm suffering. I trust in your goodness. I trust in your power. I trust in your sovereignty. I trust that, you know, you are the Lord who came down and experienced hell for me. You love us so much. You're not going to turn your back on us. You can make something incredible out of this. And that repentance is a, is a brand new frame of mind. And I think, you know, 
some of you, maybe you remember The Matrix. The Matrix was an epic movie, by the way, which I was graduating from high school when The, um, the Matrix came out in 1999. But you know, the main character, Neo, he realizes that there's something else out there. And this character Morpheus comes and offers him two pills, a red pill and a, and a blue pill. And says, if you take the red pill, then things will just go back to normal. And you won't, you can believe whatever you want to believe. But if you take the blue pill, then you're going to experience reality. And I can't promise you that everything's going to be easy. But the thing is, you'll know the truth. And you'll discover and experience what your purpose is about. Maybe that's what repentance looks like for us right now, is embracing the uncertainty, embracing the questions, embracing the reality that we don't know. There's just so much we don't know. We don't know how this is all going to work out. We don't know why it happened. We don't know, you know, what life is going to look like on the other side. But maybe this is exactly where God wants us so that we stop moving forward with our lives in the old way where we had all our comforts and we knew everything and we had control and it was all about us and our ego and our agenda. And God is saying, step into an existence in a life in which you're really, really trusting me. And it has to be trust because you have nothing else because you don't know. And you are in a position where you're completely relying on God. And I think if we're willing to say, you know what, we got to, we got to let go of the past we got to let go of all these old things that we used to be attached to. God has stripped them away, and we're holding on to God and saying, God, will you lead us into this? Will you teach us what obedience looks like? Will you show us the way we're depending on you? That, my friends, is what God is going to use to raise up a new generation of his church that is going to change the world. But it is all about if. It is if. If and only if we're willing to embrace faith and repentance during this time. God often speaks to us in a whisper, and maybe we were so busy with our lives and doing so much stuff that we needed to be quarantined so that we could slow down and we could be quiet enough to listen to the voice of God. Maybe this is what it takes for us to really listen and to really look to God for what we need. I believe he's shaping us. I believe God is refining the church and he's preparing the church for what is next. If, if we will not turn away, if we will not give up, if we will not despair, but if we will continue to look to God and rely on him and willingly step into the unknown. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, they will run and not grow weary. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray now that we would step into the unknown as we wait upon you. May you strengthen us, God. Lord, we repent of trying to control everything. We repent of half-heartedness. We repent of making our lives about ourselves. Lord, may we make the most of this exile period. May we turn to you with our whole hearts and depend on you and look to you like we've never done before. We pray that revival will break out in the world, Lord, and that your church would rise up, that you'd use this time to shape us and to mold us as we step into the unknown, to be the people that you desire us to be, people filled with your spirit, people empowered by you, Lord, to love and to serve and to be obedient to your purposes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.